There are lots of different religions in the world. Humans have created about 10,000 different religions and about 1,000 different gods. There's a common argument given against religion which goes something like this. There isn't agreement on which god exists or which one might exist or what it wants or what it thinks. In fact, there's chaotic disagreement with countless religions and countless denominations among them. Welcome to Theology Unleashed. I'm Arjuna, and today I'll be responding to the argument from inconsistent revelation. This argument has a few different formulations. One of them I've only come across in print, and we can call it the robust philosophical version. It focuses on the premise that there is no way of establishing the veracity of religious claims. The other version we can call the rhetorical device. It's commonly used in debates and speeches given by atheists, activists, and skeptics. It focuses on the premise that there are many world religions which all make contradictory claims. What is the probability that Yahweh, the God that uh, David believes in, is the one true God, and that Amun-Ra, Aphrodite, Apollo, Baal, Brahma, Ganesha, Isis, Mithras, Osiris, Shiva, Thor, Vishnu, Wotan, Zeus, and the other 986 gods are all false gods? One problem I see with this argument is it treats the opinions of religious people as if they are a valid epistemology. Now, perhaps they're just doing this for the sake of argument to say that if we assume that opinions are valid epistemologies, then we have a problem because there are so many contradictory opinions. I think there's a reason why the rhetorical device version of the argument doesn't spend any time on the first premise, which claims that there is no valid epistemology and religion must only be accepted on the opinions of religious people. The reason being is that this premise is harder to defend. And in actuality, it's a straw man of religion and it's a snuck premise. I'll link to a video in the description which explains the logical fallacy known as a snuck premise. It's a straw man of religion because there are plenty of religions which are not saying simply accept it because we told you to. There are various ways that religious claims can be tested. They can be examined for logical consistency, for whether they conform to our experience of reality. And if they give a practice which can be applied, then the results of that practice can be measured to see if they are consistent with what is promised by the process. This is similar to if somebody takes directions from a complete stranger. They have no way of knowing if those directions are accurate. They simply have to accept them on the say-so of the stranger. However, when they follow the directions, they will find that what the person told them is consistent with what they see. They may get to certain street corners and find that they see exactly what the person told them they would see when they arrive at that location. And this adds credence to the veracity of the directions from the stranger. In a similar way, if we practice a religious process and our consciousness improves in measurable ways, exactly as was promised by the process, then this adds credence to the veracity of the religion. A lot can be said about the epistemology of religion, and that's not the topic of this video. My only point here is to establish that this argument is a straw man of religion. I've drawn this argument up as a syllogism so we can examine its logical premises and see if it stands up. It goes like this. Premise one, religions can only be accepted on faith with no way of verifying the claims made. Premise two, all the world religions contradict one another. Premise three, mutually exclusive claims cannot simultaneously be true. Conclusion, it's more likely that none of them are true. This argument is valid, meaning it works if the premises are found to be true. However, the conclusion goes too far. The most we could conclude from this argument is that we don't have a good reason for believing that any particular religion is true. Now, perhaps when atheists use this argument, that's all they're trying to achieve. And that's something they can achieve with this argument if the premises are found to be true. So let's have a look at these premises. The nature of these premises can be illustrated using a crime scene analogy. If we have two witnesses for a crime who both disagree on what took place, and we have no other way of determining what happened, then the crime cannot be solved. If, however, it's found that the witnesses only disagree on irrelevant details, then the crime can still be solved. 
For example, the two witnesses might disagree over whether the suspect was eating a bagel or a donut at the time of the murder. If the witnesses both agree on all the relevant events about the crime that was committed, then we don't have a problem due to the contradiction about the donut or bagel. So we need to ask the question, at what level do the disagreements exist between these various religions? Are they arguing over details like whether God is called Yahweh or Allah? Or do they actually have vastly different ontologies, different ideas about the nature of reality and God? The other way this argument can fail is if it's found that the witness testimony is not required to incriminate the suspect. This could be done by finding other types of evidence which are sufficient for establishing guilt. In the case of religion, this would be done by having other epistemologies that weren't just the say-so of people professing a particular religion. Now let's hear one way Richard Dawkins has used this argument. And I recognised that it was an accident of my birth that I happened to have been born into the Christian faith, and I recognised instantly that had I been born into born in, say, Afghanistan or born in India, I would have believed very different things. And that quite rightly shook my faith in the particular religion that I'd been brought up in. So Richard Dawkins is making two claims as part of that argument. For one, he's claiming that there's no way of assessing the veracity of religious claims, and they must simply be accepted on say-so. And for two, he's claiming that there are vast differences between Islam and Christianity. One thing he's ignoring is that if we really look at world religion seriously, and, not just, and we don't just take this cartoon version of world religions, what we actually find is that um, in world religions, you tend to find disagreement on a dogmatic level, not on a theological level. For example, we get silly tribalistic disputes among world religions based on things like this. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is God's prophet, which is sometimes translated as there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is Allah's prophet, which tries to make Muslims sound other and ignores the fact that the Arabic word for God, whether you're Christian or Jewish or Muslim, is Allah. So Richard Dawkins and many others are claiming that Islam, Christianity, and so on are vastly different religions making vastly different claims. This is even a common attitude amongst members of those religions. But what's really going on here is a lack of philosophical thinking. If we examine these different religions philosophically, we find wide agreement. If we look at Hinduism, we do find a diversity of religious thought. There is a lot of different philosophies and ontologies found within Hinduism. But if you look back historically, the main vein of it is Vaishnavism, which holds a version of monotheism very much like the ideas held by Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Now, it is very common for these religions to hold exclusivist views. This kind of view could be something like saying, if you don't learn karate from me, there's no one else that can teach you karate. I'm the only teacher in town. That's kind of the claim that's made when you have an exclusivist religious view. I showed in my other video, debunking exclusivism, how it's an incoherent idea. The idea that God is all loving and at the same time he will punish his children for minor theological mistakes is absurd. If God really is all loving, then he will be reaching out to people in multiple different faiths and assisting them in coming back to him. I'll put a link to the video debunking exclusivism in the description and you can click on the icon up there to watch it now. So this is one example of how we don't just simply have to take somebody's word for it. We can examine this philosophically. If we take this exclusivist claim and examine it in conjunction with the claim that God is all loving, we find that one of them has to be rejected. And the one we're going to reject is the exclusivism, because God being all loving is a primary claim. If something is found to be in contention with this claim, then the other one has to be rejected, not the claim about God being all loving. It's pretty common for these atheists to paint a caricature of religion rather than actually demonstrating that they know anything about religion or its history. Well, what's, what's inconvenient for any religious person in a debate of this kind is that um, 
he or she knows exactly what it's like to be an atheist with respect to all of the other religions. That's just simply not true. That would be like saying a tribe in Africa that has a different name for the sun to a tribe in China is an atheist to the sun, which the tribe in China knows. It's just absurd. And historically, there are many examples of religions which have an inclusivist view, which think that members of other religions and other traditions are worshiping the same God and understanding the same reality to us, but they're just worshiping in a different way and understanding in a different way. That variations in understanding could be due to misunderstanding the reality, or they could be due to focusing on different features. What you find in South Asia is, going back thousands and thousands of years, people understood that the same God is present in many places and called by different names. So that's the first thing It's not true, that religions tend to be fanatical. A lot of the prominent and serious philosophers throughout the Greco-Roman tradition and throughout India were monotheists. So the centerpiece of Greek education was Homer, and Plato says that we should not study Homer because he presents this childish polytheism. And so Plato is arguing powerfully in favor of monotheism. And in the Greco-Roman world, there are others. There are many uh, monotheists, but they're philosophical. Monotheists, they're not fanatical. They're not sectarian. They just talk philosophically about one God. Polytheism was on a popular level. In the book Pagan Monotheism in the Roman Empire, it said, examining debates between Celsus and Oregon and between Augustine and Platonists first locates the basis of their disagreement in questions of religious authority and worship. Both sides did in fact agree on a single ultimate divinity. By studying the history of religion, we can learn two things. First, we can learn that this kind of fanaticism that only my God is the real God and everyone else is worshiping a false idol, that kind of fanaticism is not as common as we're led to believe. There's a lot of people historically who thought that we're just worshiping the same truth in a different way and understanding it in a different way. The other thing we can learn is that a lot more people believed in a single ultimate divinity than we're led to believe. So as I said before, a question we need to ask is at what level do these disagreements actually exist? These people all appeared in different parts of the world. They spoke different languages and, and to some extent, you know, they each had their own unique teachings. But if we go deeper, if we go beneath the surface of historical details, what did they actually teach? We find remarkable similarities. So I've put together a list of claims which are accepted by virtually every religion, including Buddhists who don't even believe that God exists. They all reject natural sciences as being the only means of acquiring knowledge, and they all accept descending knowledge as being valuable and offering truth. In other words, they reject scientism and accept descending knowledge, some kind of revealed scripture or prophet coming down. They all reject absolute materialism and hold that matter isn't all that exists, that there is a metaphysical layer to reality. This covers ideas like reincarnation. They all teach that an eternal state or destination is the highest goal of human life and is attained by availing oneself of revealed knowledge. And they all teach that our existence extends beyond the death of the body. Of course, many of them have different ideas about what the nature of the soul is and where they go, but they all accept that life does not finish when the body's finished. More can be said about Buddhism. Although Buddhism doesn't hold that God exists, it doesn't deny his existence either. Lord Buddha gave negative teachings, which means he described the absolute truth by telling us what it is not. But he did not tell us that God does not exist. So there's no contradiction between Buddhism and the major monotheisms in that regard. Here's another articulation of the argument, which I can use to illustrate the logical fallacies now that I've built up my argument. The church within, which alone salvation is to be found, is not necessarily the church of Rome, so says John Leslie Mackey, but perhaps that of the Anabaptists, or the Mormons, or the Muslim Sunnis, or the worshippers of Kali, or of Odin. We are not, as Pascal claims, embarked to wager upon a two-sided coin, but rather a thousand-sided die. 
I can refute this argument on all fronts. I can show that if we are to accept this logic, we must reject atheism, not theism. And I can also show that this logic is not valid. If we accept this logic, we must reject atheism because when we examine philosophically, we find wide agreement on core philosophical principles among almost all of the major non-atheistic worldviews. I gave four examples of major philosophical principles in which all of these non-atheistic worldviews agree. What are the chances? What are the chances? That all of these non-atheistic worldviews are false and all the people who believe them are wrong and these few atheists who are only large in number in recent years are right. What are the chances that these guys got the right God and the right religion and the billions of other people that don't believe what they believe got it wrong? Is it more likely that all of these religion and God beliefs are socially constructed, psychologically constructed, and that none of them are right in any reality sense, in any ontological sense? They're all constructed this way. Going with this logic here, we must conclude that it's more likely that the atheists are wrong because they are the ones who are outnumbered. Do I have any believers in any of the gods I just read off? So like me, the rest of you are all atheists. Some of us just go one god further. No, you don't just go one god further. You make a categorically different claim. As I demonstrated earlier, all of the major world religions agree on core philosophical principles. It's the atheists who make a categorically different claim and are therefore more likely to be wrong using this logic. However, this argument is not valid. It's guilty of a logical fallacy called the inflation of conflict. It's tantamount to claiming that because physicists cannot agree on theories about the Big Bang, that none of the theories about the Big Bang must be true. That's faulty reasoning. It could be that one of them's true, or it could be that there's a theory which unifies all of them, which we just aren't able to comprehend or have not discovered just yet. In a similar way, it could be that many aspects of many religions are true in a way that harmonizes with one another when we see the bigger picture. But that's a topic for another video. Thanks for the view. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And here's a little clip from Srila Prabhupada. I understand, but do you feel that in the Bible and the Quran and so forth, don't you run into conflicts at all or contradictions in those particular philosophies? No, I don't find any conflict because the ultimate goal is God. So you have to understand God and try to love him. So you can go through any religious process. If the goal is attained, that you understand what is God and you try to love him, then your life is perfect.